I've been doing experimenting a little bit lately with some new recipes. And one of the most memorable is my attempt at this cake. Um, it was coming up to, um, it was Lorna and uh, Ken's mum, my mother-in-law, and Aaron's birthday a day apart. And so I wanted to make this really special cake to celebrate their birthday. So I grabbed, you know, the delicious magazine you can get from Coles there. So I grabbed it. It had this really nice, um, looked very nice, strawberry cheesecake on the front. And so I grabbed it and took it home. And as I flicked through, I came across this chocolate and beetroot cake. And I thought, oh, that sounds great. That sounds really nice. Like, you know, you, um, you know, a carrot cake is yum, right? You put vegetables in and it makes it more moist and just a nice flavour. And then I thought of, um, what else is there? Pumpkin. And I thought of all these different vegetables and how they make cakes taste even better. And I thought, wow, this looks great. So I was reading through, you know, there's kind of a blurb at the top about it. And I probably should have tweaked when it said, because it was talking about how wonderful a cake is, but it started out by saying earthy and wonderful. <laughs> and I probably should have picked up on earthy, but I just kept going, being me, being open to lots of different food, as you can see, but also just being quite hopeful, gullible. I'm thinking, right, it's in the magazine. It's, it's a delicious magazine. It must be delicious. So I got all the ingredients, which were um, hazelnut meal. I've never used hazelnut meal before. The icing is the icing on the cake. It's made from avocado and coconut cream and cocoa and sweetened with maple syrup. So I made the cake and it looked pretty much like that, didn't it, Mum? It looked like that? Yeah. So I brought it to the birthday and when it was the time we served it up, and as they say, the proof is in the pudding, it was hard going. It was worth it, I would say. And Ken was... Ken was, God love him, he was, he was sort of like, because um, he knew how hard I worked on it, he was like, it's not awful, it's just, he said it's, it's the aftertaste. And, and my daughter-in-law is the youngest of eight, and she eats literally anything, and she was struggling. <laughs> there were no takers for second, second helpings, and so probably at least half the cake went into the bin. The interesting thing for me is that somebody thought it was awesome. You know, like I've got a wide, I've got a broad palate, I can eat lots of things, but I don't even want a second piece either. <laughs> but somebody did. Somebody actually wrote this recipe, and to them, probably they're from, if I could Google them, they're probably from Nimbin or somewhere, but um, they thought it was awesome. Okay. And so it is that for some people, what, what somebody will enjoy eating, somebody else will find weird and just not be able to kind of, just totally unpalatable. And it's like that, isn't it? Like, we've got lots of different cultures in this church. And, and you know, I know some, some of you love honeys, and I'm not quite sure why, but for you, it's <laughs> awesome. It's like the best meal out. So we have these different palates. What somebody loves, somebody else finds really difficult. And not only in relationships, just in different cultures, right? For you, particularly those of you married cross-culturally, you will have, I'm sure you would have experienced this where something that's part of your culture feels so right, and yet for your partner, it seems really weird and you have to get used to those different cultures. So what's weird for someone is right for someone else, right? So it doesn't mean that it's wrong, it just means that we just don't quite understand it or get it. And in life, there are often things that happen to us that we think, you know, maybe it's an experience that we go through, something that we find really hard. It's not necessarily wrong, but it's just hard because we don't understand it or we're not used to it. We've been looking over the last few weeks and um, four, actually, this is the fifth week that we're looking at this idea of the Good Shepherd, Jesus being the Good Shepherd. And it's been... I think it's actually been a really exceptional series, hasn't it? Like every week there's some gem or some gems that I think, you know, the goal of it is that we would be able this year to understand God in a new way, understand God as a new shepherd and grow. That's the goal of, of going through all of this is so that there's something that we can take away, that we can apply to our life and that we can grow through. Um, so, I'm the last week, and I thought to myself, what could I bring, what could I add to the sermon series that hasn't already been said? 
And it wasn't long, I, I looked at, of course, one of the main chapters we've been looking at or passages is Psalm 23. And so as I started reading through Psalm 23, it wasn't very long before I kind of got to a couple of verses that are a little bit like the beetroot and chocolate cake. <laughs> so we love the first few verses. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Then we come to verses 4 and 5. So we love verses 1, 2 and 3. Like, what's not to love about them? God's leading us. Life is idyllic. Verses 4 and 5. I just wanted to bring out a couple of things from both of these verses as I looked at it. And... Um, and just some things that struck me that were interesting. The first one, it says, When I walk, verse 4, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are, sorry, wrong, I've got a different translation. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me, your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. We don't like tough times, but the first thing I noticed about this verse is that it is part of the psalm. Amen. It's there. It's there as much as verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 4 is really there. Yeah. And it's this idea that as God is leading us along the path, there will be those times that are just idyllic, but there will be times when we go through tough stuff, yeah. when we're walking through whatever that may be, maybe our health, maybe our relationships, maybe what, whatever it is financial, what I noticed about this, we, we reused an image um, in earlier weeks, of, and you might remember it, of the shepherd out ahead of the sheep. And in the first verses, we kind of have that idea, don't we, that God, as a shepherd, is leading us to the water. He's leading us to the place to rest. What I notice in this verse is that Jesus changes his position. When we're going through hard times, which are part of the journey, instead of being out in ahead of us, the shepherd comes beside us. He walks beside us through whatever it is we're going through. So the truth is that we will go through hard times, but the shepherd promises that he will walk beside us. His rod and his staff are there to protect us. So he's there, he's there ready to fight. He's there ready to fight for us when we're going through those really hard times. Um, secondly, then in verse 5, this is such an interesting verse. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honour me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. The shepherd's out the front. Then he comes and walks beside us when we need him. And in this verse, if you notice, we're no longer sheep anymore. It's like a whole new level of intimacy that God is kind of trying to communicate to us. We're actually invited to this table, this, this meal with the king. And sheep don't do that. They don't sit up at the table with the king, right? They're just, he's leading them to find grass along. And I think what God is trying to say to us is that when, we, when we're going through those tough times, there's this incredible grace and this incredible richness that God gives to us. Amen. And this, it says it's like he invites us to this table to eat with him in the presence of our enemies. Um, think of the most wonderful celebration of your life. Maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was just an amazing celebration. Ours was not the most amazing celebration. Thank goodness our marriage has been better than our wedding day. But uh, for some of you, you had a wonderful wedding day. Others will be... Maybe like, you know, you've, you've just won the grand final of sport and, and just that feeling, maybe it's a birthday party, maybe it's catching up with somebody that you haven't seen for a long time. Whatever it is, that feeling, think about that feeling of this amazing celebration and how you felt during that time, how it felt for you. Because that's actually the language or the meaning behind these words. I used to think of it being more like, God's provided something for me to eat while my enemies, in spite of my enemies around, kind of mocking me. But that's not actually what this verse is saying. What it's saying is we're there with the king and he's providing the richness of heaven for us to feast on when we're going through tough times. And our enemies might be there, 
But then there is the losers. There there is the captives. They're not there mocking us. I, we had um, at my son Aaron's wedding, uh, our, our son's wedding, um, last just over a year ago, and he, it was the most wonderful celebration. It really was the wedding day that everyone would want to have. And at the end of the ceremony, there we are, praying over them. It was filled with Christian love and, you know, vows, and etc. The next photo is um, us all scrubbed up nice at the reception, the table, the food, everything. It was just this idyllic, it was the most wonderful day. The next photo you can see I'm just having the best time. I love this photo of me. It just brings me so much joy. All of my double chin, all my many chins. Reminds me of that movie Chicken Run. But it was just, it was such a fabulous day. I don't know what it is for you. What experience comes to mind when you think of just the most amazing celebration? Verse 5 of Psalm 23 is that for us. That there is a grace, there is God's favour, his peace, his joy. Whatever we need during those hard times, we will go through them. But there's something there. And you might think, yeah, well, you know, how, 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 have you seen this? In action, and actually recently I've got two friends that are going through the most unimaginable things. One lost her son tragically. One, we know Nina, going through chemo. And I tell you, there's there's a grace on both of them that is supernatural. Mm -hmm. There's a presence of God on them. And you, you literally talk to Nina. You, I talk to my other friend. And I think, man alive, there's something going on between you and God in this. You're going through the worst possible thing and yet God is closer and God is richer and the, the fruit of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit is closer and more abundant than I've ever seen it on your life. Because perhaps when we lose precious things and they're taken away, maybe we realise how precious God is, right? We realise that when we, you know that saying when you um, gave the whole world and lose your soul, perhaps it's, the op perhaps it's the opposite of that. When we lose the whole world, perhaps it's then that we actually really gain our soul. Yes. And we find out how much God loves us and how close he is. Such a beautiful image for us to remember when we're going through stuff. If I made the rules, I think I'd probably leave suffering out. I don't like suffering, I don't like feeling bad, and I'm sure you don't either, that awful feeling of when you're afraid of a medical result, or your heart is broken because of a relationship, or you don't know where your next meal is coming from, whatever. If it was me, I'd probably want to leave a lot of that out, particularly in my life, but the truth is that this psalm is telling us, and right through the Bible, that God has other ideas for us, and he's greater and he knows more than we do so it's in there and Jesus makes the rules but the amazing thing about our God is that he plays by the same rules that he made for us he doesn't sit back and just comfort us when when we're in trouble he actually um, we know that Jesus suffered he spent his whole life suffering and then coming to Easter that beautiful uh, message from mercy that he died for us so that we would be free um, John 10, 1 to 39, which we've been looking at as well, has two interesting things. It's an interesting passage because in one hand, firstly, Jesus says that he is the gate. So he makes the rules, right? I'm the gate. I'm the only way that you can get into eternal life. I make the rules and you, if you want to follow me, follow me, but this is the rules. But then in the same verses, just verse down, he says, but I'm also the good shepherd. And as the shepherd... I lay down my life for the sheep. I'm with you on the journey and ultimately I lay my life down and I sacrifice and I suffer for you because you are, I am your shepherd. You see, as Christians, we, we go through what everybody else does. <coughs> we're not immune to suffering. We're not immune to pain. But the difference with us is that um, even though earthly disasters may come upon us, um, nothing will come upon us that we're not saved from. Because we have eternity, we have this relationship with God, which is, uh, which is the greatest of riches. That's the, the meal at the table. It's the greatest thing that God can give us. 
I was recently speaking to um, Alison Skeener, who's here today, and um, Alison and Manny, for those who may not know them and their story, um, about over five years ago, they embarked on what was going to be a wonderful uh, renovation on their family home. <coughs> However, the renovation went horribly wrong, and um, basically the house was unlivable, they could no longer live there, and it was just ruined, everything was absolutely ruined. So they had to move out, they have been living in a rental apartment, and fighting for justice to get their money back, to, to be able, not knowing they put so much money into it, and they're kind of stuck in this position. And through it, the prayer hotline, people have been praying and standing with them, and they've been to court numerous times. Alison's kind of put her life on hold to, to really, in many ways, to kind of just fight this to get justice. But all the way through, we've been standing with them in prayer. And I was speaking to Alison um, on the phone, and they still had had no resolution. Um, and Alison said to me these words that I thought were so cool. She said, we're still going through it, but I know I can see God in the detail. I can see God in the detail. I can see that he's working behind the scenes. Just the connections that are happening and the people I'm meeting and the, the things that are happening. And there was absolutely no resolution at that stage. Praise God, there has been a resolution to it and all glory to God for that. But I thought, what a cool statement that God is in the detail. Sometimes he, he, he lets us walk through. We have to walk through some really difficult times. But this psalm is saying God is in the detail. And I thought of that, you know that saying, the devil's in the detail? I thought, you know what? The shepherd's in the detail. Yeah. Our shepherd's in the detail. And how cool if we could just remember that and keep that in our minds. And it stuck with me, and I'm so thankful to Alison. I just think Alison and Manny have been incredible in their, their faith and their forgiveness and their humility and their trust in their God. And I, and I believe there's been a grace over you to be able to go through that because it's been unimaginable, but the shepherd's in the detail. And how about, I think it would be really cool if we remembered that because we're going to need it in, we're going to need it soon, we're going to need it in a, in a day very soon because that's what life does, right? I'd like to read a passage now from the book of Zechariah. It's a book in the Old Testament. And these, this passage, this chapter 9 was written 500 years before Jesus was born. And it's what they call a Messianic psalm, which means that for the, the people of Israel, the Israelites, they were waiting for Messiah to come. And Zechariah prophesied these, these words about the coming of Christ. And it was 500 years before Jesus was actually born. But let's um, have a look. I'm just going to pick up a couple of them, not the whole chapter you'll be thinking. Uh, starting at verse 9, shout and cheer, daughter Zion. Raise the roof, daughter Jerusalem. Your king is coming, a good king who makes all things right, a humble king riding a donkey, a mere cult of a donkey. And just a bit further down, he will offer peace to the nations, a peaceful rule worldwide and from the four winds of the seven seas. And then just the last couple of verses, their God will save the day. He'll rescue them. They will become like sheep, gentle and soft, or like gemstones in a crown, catching all the colours of the sun. Then how they will shine, shimmer and glow. The Israelites, when Jesus was born, 500 years later, they were hanging on to this passage. They knew it. They, they, they recited it was part of their teaching and they knew it and they were waiting. Men were they waiting. Jesus, was, they were under a lot of persecution, oppression, really suffering, and they were waiting for Messiah to come and to deliver them. Anyone know what today is? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. So Jesus is days out from the crucifixion. And keep in mind the, the people of Israel knew this passage. They understood it. They were waiting they understood this imagery of a king coming on a donkey ride. Jesus is days away from his crucifixion. And I think of it like when you read through John, it's like when you watch the fireworks on New Year's Eve, right? And it starts out and it's nice and these colours are going up and it's nice and it begins to build. And you get just to, toward the end of that 
amazing uh, fireworks display that we see every year and it ramps up right and all of a sudden if you've ever been underneath it they just go for gold and there's just fireworks going everywhere it's just this mass and it's building and building and I feel like this is kind of what was happening at that time just days out from Jesus crucifixion because around the edges were the enemies waiting to kill him and and uh, Judas had already signed the deal with them they were just waiting for their time right and Jesus in the midst is just going I've got days I've just got days I'm going to go I'm going to go nuts and so he's healing people his miracles happening he'd raised Lazarus from the dead just a couple of days before and so it was just all ramping up and there was a crowd this crowd that was following him around and watching I don't know how long they'd been with Jesus but up until this point Jesus kept saying if you read it he's saying oh don't tell anybody because he knew his time was not ready it wasn't his time yet so he's saying don't tell anybody don't tell anybody but on this day in john's gospel he says that just very simply jesus got a donkey and he sat on it and that was like a flame on a uh, you know it's a, like a bushfire on a, on a dry forest it just sent these people crazy because in their mind, they were thinking, I think this guy's the Messiah. I think it's him. Let's follow him. And the crowd was gathering around him. And Jesus was saying, no, 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 no. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. And then he sat on the donkey and they go, aha, it is him. He is the Messiah. We were right. And so they, they, they just went ballistic like the fireworks. They're just going and just these... Um, erupted this incredible praise and they just thought what can we do and they grabbed palm branches which is why we call it palm sunday which speak of royalty and they begin to to wave them as you can see in that picture they begin to wave them over him and they begin to take off their clothes to make a carpet for him to ride in and jesus rode exactly like that passage from uh, zechariah he rode humbly on a donkey into jerusalem to be crucified and I think what an amazing illustration of what we've been looking at today firstly that um, oh lost my notes firstly what <laughs> Jesus at, a, at some sort of supernatural table in the presence of his enemies all this stuff's happening around and yet this is a fulfillment of a prophecy this is Jesus in a place in something that is so cosmic and so massive that the people that were with him could get it and he got it and of course the father got it it's indeed a table in the presence of his enemies there was something happening there that was supernatural and for these people this idea that the shepherd is in the detail they tweet that's the prophecy the shepherd's in the detail here he is i love that about the bible that you know, that 500 years later, <coughs> Jesus fulfills a prophecy. The shepherd is in the detail. And so he is in our lives, just like that. That sometimes we're going through things, and like Manny and Alison, nothing seems to be changing, and yet you can see God in there somehow. Sometimes nothing's changing, and God is wanting to change something in our hearts. Sometimes it's not about changing the circumstances, it's about the shepherds in the detail of our lives. And he's wanting to do something. It's happened to me so many times where something's happening outside, exterior, external, but actually the work God's wanting to do is in my heart. Just one final verse. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Friends, when life gets difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you are in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. Amen. That's what it's all about, people. We've got another year, another day, another week to serve him to become more like Christ. And on that journey, there's going to be some really great times and there's going to be some hard times. But our shepherd will walk beside us. He'll protect us. And in those times when we accept his invitation, we can come into this place where there's an abundance and we really see that the shepherd is in the detail, that God has prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. I'd love to pray for you. And just as Brian comes up, just maybe invite you to, to stand before the Lord. Because I know you're human just like me. Let's just stand together. I'd like you just to think about your own life today. Where are you at? What's going on for you? Do you feel like everything's going rosy and that you're enjoying the, the, the calmness of the water and the green grass? Or do you feel like you're walking through the valley at the moment? Do you feel like you need to be in God's presence? There's an invitation to us today. We just have to choose it. If you want to come into God's presence, Jesus made a way for us through his death and his sacrifice. His good shepherd laid down his life. The shepherd's in the detail of our lives. And the most incredible thing is that it doesn't matter what we're going through. He's there for us. He's protecting us. He's eating with us. He's talking with us. And by His Spirit, He's giving us the grace to forgive. He's giving the peace that passes understanding during the unimaginable. He's bringing comfort by His Spirit. He's bringing healing into our lives. He's doing the work. I think God knows what He's doing by putting hard times. Because He does His most beautiful work during those in, in our lives. So just as Brian plays for a moment, just invite you to, to be honest before God. Just be honest before God. Where are you at? Is your shepherd close by? Because if he's not, maybe you've walked away. He's wanting to walk beside you. He's wanting to be part of every detail of your life, in your relationships, in your struggles, in your addictions your mental health struggles. He wants to be there. He's a good shepherd. He lays down his life. 